I mean, they were absolutely fantastic when Peter was up reading, and we need the same kind of attention right now, because coming up on the stage, Brian was just talking about a man of letters, W.B. Yeats. So there's another man of letters, who I have had the pleasure to stand on the stage with quite a few times. Put your hands together and welcome Jonathan Lynn. and Seamus Heaney. <laughs> Who's your man? <laughs> now, I must confess <laughs> that I only met Seamus Heaney in the washroom. And I'm standing beside him, pissing, and I feel I have to say something, you know? So I, I looked up at him, he was a big man, and I said, Jesus, I'll have it to boast that I pissed alongside Seamus Heaney. <laughs> and he looked over at me and says, Aye, and if you don't watch your name, you'll have it to boast you pissed on Seamus Heaney. <laughs> so, from someone who almost pissed on a Nobel Prize laureate, I'll do this piece for Peter. We take, it, we take it as a matter of general consent that Ireland had always swarmed with geniuses. Old Erin has for centuries been running over with them, has in fact had so many of this glorious type that it has become necessary to establish a kind of emigration service for the exportation of Irish genius to other nations which, though bigger, are sadly lacking in their genius quota. Now, the leading customer for the importation of Irish genius has been our own fair land. We think it no extravagant exaggeration to say that where genius is concerned, the Irish brand tops the list with us. Here in North America, we'd rather have one good bona fide Irish genius than a half a dozen Polish, Czechoslovakian, Scandinavian, or Hungarian specimens, no matter what their reputation. <laughs> it's true that visiting English writers are still in considerable demand and ply a thriving trade before the culture clubs and female forums of the Corn Belt. <laughs> Almost any ninth-rate scribbler from Great Britain can still come over here and insult the country with the choicest and most indecipherable sneers in his whole Oxford vocabulary and command prices from his adoring audiences that no native son could dream of asking. Yes, there is still considerable demand for the English writer. But among the hope tone, so to speak, the true sophisticates of culture, the Irish bards and storytellers come first. <laughs> a bad English writer can still put in a profitable six or eight weeks and insult the country with the choicest and most indecipherable sneers in his whole Oxford vocabulary, but to do so requires considerable travelling, and the English writer cannot always pick his spots. He must occasionally prepare himself for the uncomfortable exigencies of one-night stands, bad accommodation, poor food. <laughs> But an Irish writer is faced with none of these embarrassing possibilities. He can pick his spots and do as he damn pleases. He can remain in New York in the perfumed salons of the act-loving plutocracy and can always have the very best of everything provided he exercise just a very small degree of caution. 
and has sense enough to know on which side his cake is caviar. <laughs> An English writer may have to stand an occasional round of drinks or stay with the second best family in Hamtrak, Michigan, but an Irish writer never. <laughs> an English writer may have to have at least the vestige of a reputation, to have received the endorsement of Hugh Walpole, or to have in his pocket a letter of introduction from J.B. Priestley. But an Irish writer needs nothing. It's naturally preferable if someone has heard of him before, but it is by no means essential. The main thing is that he be a visiting Irish writer. And of course, all visiting Irish writers are not only geniuses, but the most extra special A number one, 18 carat geniuses in existence. <laughs> After that, no introduction is necessary. He can just call himself Sean O'Mulligan, or Seamus O'Toole, or Peter Damien Murphy, <laughs> or some other whimsical appellate of this nature, and everything will be all right. Hey, he need only get off the boat and announce to the reporters that he's the author of some untranslated and untranslatable epic written in pure Gaelic. He disdains, of course, to use the English tongue unless it be to cash a check. Otherwise, he abhors the race that has cruelly, bloodily, and damnably oppressed Old Erin for a thousand years, etc., 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 and from that time on, his path is smooth, his bed is roses. If, in addition, he only come down the gangplank muttering something through his whiskers about the green leprechaun, which they do be saying an old man in the west was after seeing on the hill behind his house year after year be dead. Or some other elfin talk of this nature by which the bearded adults of the Irish race strive to convince themselves and other people that they're really only just a lot of little boys. The whole thing will be lapped up greedily, will travel the rounds of the salons and be hailed as a perfect masterpiece of whimsy. Just too Irish quaint and delightful for words. <laughs> it may be true that while all this is going on, while the visiting Seans and Seamuses are muttering through their whiskers about their fairies and leprechauns and are being coddled in the silken laps of the adoring plutocracy as a reward for their whimsical caprice. Some poor benighted bastard of a native son, some gaunt-eyed yokel from Texas, Tennessee, Nebraska or Minnesota may be eating his heart out in a Greenwich Village garret opening canned beans at midnight and reeking out his vision of his life here in America with all the passion, fury, terror, suffering, poverty, cruelty and neglect that a young artist in this abundant land may know. It may be true if we say that while the visiting Seans and Seamuses are chirping on Park Avenue to an adoring audience of silken wenches. Some wild-eyed native youth may be pounding on the walls of his garret with bloody knuckles, wondering when, where, and how in God's name, in a swarming city of eight million, he can find a woman. <laughs> or slay his hunger for a moment with the bought and bitter briefness of a whore. Yes, while those lovely legs cross slowly and slide the silken ties, while the fragrant bellies heave in unction to the elfin blandishments of Sean, a boy may be burning in the night, burning in the lone dark watches of darkness and given a tongue to silence that will shape a new language long after lovely legs and silken thighs and fragrant bellies and Sean's and Seamus's are no more. <laughs> but have no perturbations, gentle listener. For when the boy has won through from an agonized silence to an uttered fame, 
When his toiling and imperiled soul has beat its way to shore, when, by his own unaided effort, he stands safe on land, <laughs> you may depend upon it, he will at once be encumbered with the help he no longer needs. Lovely legs and silken ties and fragrant bellies will then heave amorously for him as they do now for Sean, and every little whore of wealth and fashion will contend for the honours of the bed that poverty had bachelored and that fame has filled. The youth, once left to rot and starve, will now be fawned upon and honeyed over by the very apes of fashion who previously ignored him and who now seek to make him their ape. And the treachery of their adoration will be more odious than the treachery of their neglect. For it stands written in fame's lexicon that he who lets himself be whored by fashion will be whored by time. <laughs>